of the church. Many of you all are church kids, former church kids, all grown up church kids. Um, we, we do some things really, really well in the Church of the Nazarene and our camps. Um, are, we, we do well, and NYC is a Nazarene Youth Conference is a once, usually a once in a lifetime activity for our uh, high school students. We've got 13 of our students going, and uh, Clay is uh, their sponsor, traveling with them. I got to go to NYC as a uh, almost a high school senior in 1987. Um, we went to Washington, D.C., um, and, and as a college student, I got to go back in 1991 as a representative of the school I was uh, attending, and then I got to take my youth group, which, oh my, oh, what stories I could tell. In 1999, we went to uh, Toronto, Canada. NYC has been in Mexico, it's been in Switzerland, it's been in Canada, it's been all over the United States, and this coming week it's in Tampa. It is a unique event. Um, start planning now if you are going to have a high school student in the next three years, start planning now because they're going again in three years. Um, because of the mix up with the schedule with General Assembly and, and NYC and usually they're on off years every two years, but because of COVID and the postponement of General Assembly, blah, 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 they're going again in three years. So we've only got this much time to plan and uh, send our students, but it's, it's, a, it's a great event. Be in prayer for that this week. Look, can I hit you with some science? That's why everybody came to church this morning was to get some science. Okay, this is probably more sociology, but is anybody familiar with the population collapse theory? Population collapse? Okay, when I was born in 1970, there were 3.6 billion people on the planet billion with a B, 3.6 in my lifetime. Last November, I'm not sure they counted, but last November 2020, it was estimated that the 8 billionth people, person, sorry, appeared on the planet. So in my lifetime, from 1970 to November 2022, it went from 3.6 billion to 8 billion billion people. Now, in case you're not good at math, we've doubled in my lifetime. It's not my fault, but I just happen to be around for it. We've doubled. Now, we can't double every 50 years, right? So here's the theory. Here's the population collapse theory, that as the population has grown, Sociologists have looked at the population and it has already started to even out. They say but by 2050, in just less than 30 years, by 2050 we're going to be at 8.5 billion. And do you know where we'll be at 2100? Seven. It's going, it's going to go down. The population of the world, see, back in 1960, the average family in the world had five kids. Today, the average family in the world has 2.2 kids. Now, I don't know what you do with your 2.2 kid. <laughs> but the average family in the world has gone from five kids to 2.2, and just Keeping a, a, a stasis in the population is 2.1. Countries like China that have over a billion people, countries like India that have over a billion people, their population growth has started to dive. And here's the problem. We need young people. Do you know why we need young people? Because you can't make new old people. <laughs> we're not make it, We're not going to run out of old people because the world has some old people, and the world has some up and coming old people. Everybody that's breathing in and breathing out today is going to become an old people. But we need new people to replace those that go on to glory. Here's why this matters. 
A growing society has a bunch of young. Picture, picture a pyramid. A bunch of young. And then on the shoulders of the young are the adults. The pyramid's getting smaller. And then coming in, uh, uh, the, the smallest amount of, of PR are our elderly. And our Google, uh, Google population pyramid, if you're a real serious science geek and you really want to start to freak out. This is why this matters. Because in the church, we're seeing what the world is seeing. We need new babies in the church. Kyle and Megan, thanks for bringing your new baby today. We need new babies. We need babies in the church. We need young in the church. We need those that are young in the faith, not just in their age. We, don't, we need lots of kids. We need lots of teens. We need lots of young adults. We need lots of adults. We need lots of old folks. But in the faith, we've got to have young. How do you get young believers? If only there was perhaps a book that could give us some light on this subject, some wisdom perhaps. If only there was a great savior who could give us and point us out some things that we should be doing. Thankfully, we have that. So we're going to start a new series this morning. Um, it's, uh, it's called Four Letter Words. No, not those. <laughs> We're starting a new series this morning called Four Letter Words, and over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at different words, each of them four letters, and this morning, we have a specific word we're going to be looking at, and we see it in the gospel stories, and if you would like to, you can stand up with me this morning, and we're going to honor God's word, Matthew chapter 13. We're going to start reading in verse 3. Then Jesus told them many things and parables, and he said... A farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some seed fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. And some fell on the rocky places where it didn't have much soil. It sprang up quickly that you saw the plant. But the soil was shallow and when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns. And so the seed grew up, but the thorns grew up and choked out the plants and they didn't bear fruit. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Now that's a little bit of a philosophy trick. Uh, Jesus did this when he said this. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. And he rubbed his beard. You, you've just got to see that every time he does that. Okay, so go ahead to verse 18. In verse 18, he picks it back up. And he says, listen what, to what this parable means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed that was sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with great joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. And when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one that produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You can be seated. So last Sunday, Joe preached about fruit and, and, and picture planting a fruit tree and it starts to bear fruit and you eat the fruit and then it produces a lot more fruit. And so then you eat a lot more fruit and then it produces, it produces a lot more fruit. So you build a barn and you store the fruit. Well, what happens then when the fruit sits for a while, it spoils. So the purpose of fruit is to make more fruit trees. The purpose of the fruit isn't just for you to sit and consume, 
but to make more. And as Joe was preaching last Sunday, knowing that I was going to be heading in these directions over the next few weeks, it hit me, I've got to tag along and, and the ultimate warrior taps out and I just come in and, and I've got to come in and, and go in a, in, a, in a second direction as to what Joe started last week. When people hear the word, the word meaning the gospel, the euangelion in the Greek, the good news, when people hear the good news, sometimes it doesn't land. They're not ready for it. Sometimes it lands. It seems like it lands. And, and they immediately, they, they believe, but they're shallow. They haven't really had time to grow yet, and they fade away. Sometimes they believe and they put their trust in God, but there's so many other things in the world that are deceitful and, and demand attention that there is no fruit. But some people who hear, and you would think that's my four-letter word, but it's not. Some people who hear produce fruit. Some people produce fruit, one. The sociologist says for, for, a, for a population just to stay the same, a couple has to have 2.2 kids. You know, couples are waiting longer and longer and longer to get married if they ever do. Couples, young couples decide for many reasons not to have children, many Couples don't have children. I'm not talking about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing or great for society or bad for society. I'm just telling you what the numbers show the world today. Our population has doubled in my lifetime and it probably won't again. It could be that we're close to now. We're close to as many people on this planet as there will be. We don't, we don't know. But some of those things speak to the church. And if people are going to hear the gospel, somebody has to tell them. I preach this same sermon in different ways probably once every four or five months. I've got a gong and I keep beating this gong. I keep beating this gong. And somebody might say, Rich, you just preached this in March, because I kind of did. This, this, what we're talking about today, I just preached this topic in March. And so somebody might say, Rich, you just preached this in March. Why are you preaching it again? And so I will say, random stranger, when we get it, I'll quit preaching it. Mostly for me because I still struggle with this. If people are going to hear the good news, someone has to tell them the good news. And so here in the parable of the sower, Jesus is saying, go out and spread seed indiscriminately. Spread it. Go out and share it. If people are going to hear the good news, somebody has to tell them. Evangelism, sharing the good news, spreading the gospel, um, uh, telling people about Jesus is a high volume enterprise. You sow much, you will harvest much. If you sow little, you will harvest little. Churches around the world are, like the population perhaps someday, churches around the world are shrinking, with some exceptions. Many churches are getting smaller and older and more set in their ways and more comfortable and more inwardly centered. When Jesus said at the end of Matthew, and Joe took you there last week, Jesus said, go and make disciples. Tomorrow morning, we're going to come in here at 5 a.m., and I'm going to wipe the sleepy from my eyes, and I'm going to yawn nine times, and then I'm going to pray that God would make us a praying church, that God would make us a disciple-making church, and that God would give us more workers who go out and tell the good news of Jesus. And that's our first word today, tell. 
So I want to take you to three more places real quick. John chapter 4, this is where uh, Joe was last week. Joe Joe told the story of, of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And this is a great scene from the Chosen series. If you've watched The Chosen at the very end of season one, it's got this beautiful scene where Jesus talks to this woman who's been married five times and the man that she's living with is not her husband. And Jesus tells her that he's the Messiah. And the way that The Chosen shows it is this is the first time that Jesus kind of announces who he is. And he starts with this forgotten, lowly, outsider, Samaritan woman that he shouldn't have been talking to anyway. The very last scene of the first season of The Chosen is this story from John chapter 4. And Joe took us there and he got here to the end of the story. But Jesus said... Jesus had sent the disciples into town to get food and he stays outside because he knew he was going to have a meeting with this woman. And the the woman comes back and he has this conversation with the woman and as she is leaving to go back into town to tell everybody about Jesus, the disciples show back up and they say, Jesus, we've got lunch. And then Jesus says, here at the end of John chapter 4, I have food that no, none of you know about. And the disciples in The Chosen is really hilarious. They look at each other and said, who gave him food? Like, like Jesus isn't playing 4D chess. Uh, and and he, he knew what he was doing. Uh, look at verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 36. Jesus says this. Even now the one who reaps the blah, 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 yeah. What? Verse 35, that's what I said, verse 35. Open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. See, we don't believe that. We really don't believe that. We believe in a world today that nobody wants to hear about church, that nobody wants to hear about Jesus, that everybody has been offered Jesus and has, and has said, thanks, but no thanks, I'm good. I, I've got all the religion I need. I, I, we don't believe what Jesus says here, that the fields are ripe. Now, every single person you meet isn't ready, but somebody is, and we're going to talk about that. They're ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and, the harve- and, and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Remember in the book of Ecclesiastes, it says there's a time for sowing, And there's a time for the harvest. The good news is, the time for both is today. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps. See, you might show up in somebody's life and sow seeds into their life for the gospel that you'll never see the harvest. Conversely, you might be the one who shows up and has a conversation with somebody or prays with somebody and brings them into the family of God. And somebody else has done all the work before you even show up. Who builds his church? Jesus builds the church. We have our role. We have a place. We have, we have a function in Jesus building the church, but the responsibility for all the heavy lifting is his. We show up and do our part, or we don't. As I often say when we pray sometimes around here, God, would you come and do something in our lives today? Because if we come in here and we sit for an hour and 15 minutes and we hear a sermon and we sing some songs and we leave out there and we go out there and we do nothing about it, you know what happens? Nothing. The harvest just stays out in the field and sometimes spoils. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you didn't work for. Others have done the hard work and you've reaped the benefits of their labor. Go to the book of Romans. Paul writes, the book to, Paul writes to the church in Rome and in chapter 10, in verse 14, he says this. How then can they, people who don't know Christ yet, the people who are your neighbors, the people who are your family members, the people who live in your house, the people who you work with, the people you go to school with, the people you just cross paths with sometimes, how can they... Call on the one 
Jesus that they don't believe in? And how can they believe in one that they've not heard about? And how can people hear without someone telling them? Do you guys get it? Jesus said, go into all the world. And, and last week, Joe made mention of this, but there's some, there's some question on how we translate that. It's not Jesus is looking at his disciples saying, go into all the world preaching the gospel and making disciples. Another translation is, as you go. As you go to work in the school system. As you go to the 11th grade. As you go to your neighbor's house to borrow a, I don't know, do you still borrow a cup of sugar from anybody ever? As you go to your neighbor's house to borrow their mower. As you run into people at the store. As you go, tell them. Tell. As you go, tell. Paul, writing to the Romans, how can they believe in the one that they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them, telling them, talking about Jesus? How can they hear unless somebody tells them? And how can anyone preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those that bring good news. We are sending Ashley and Dylan, and I have no idea what their feet look like. And that really kind of makes me happy. I, I, but we are sending them. And do you know what's going to happen? They're going to go to Galleon, Ohio. And people are going to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Not because of them, but because of what God does through them. He does the same thing through you and you and you and you and you and you. Or he doesn't because we don't do it. We can come in here and we can belly up to the table and we can feed and we can go home and live our lives. We can come back next Sunday, maybe, if we don't have anything else better to do. The fish aren't biting or it's, you know, it's way too sunny outside and it, we just want to go to the park today. Or, you know, if, if we don't have anything else to do, maybe we'll come back next Sunday and we'll feed again. Or, like Jesus instructs us, we can go and go back to the book of Matthew in Matthew chapter 9. And tomorrow morning, if you come, tomorrow morning at 5 a.m., we consistently, we pray for three things. We pray that God would help us to make this place a house of prayer. We pray that God would help us to be a disciple-making church. Not just that step one. I put my belief in him. I've decided to be a Christian. That's awesome. We celebrate every one of those. But Jesus didn't say, go and make believers. He said, go and make disciples. Disciples follow him. Day in, day out, through thick, through thin. And tomorrow morning, we're going to pray that God would make us a disciple-making church. And third, we pray that God would send us, and that's my prayer today for you and for me, by the way, that God would send us more workers for the harvest. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 says this, Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, when he sees the multitude of people that don't know salvation, that don't know a good, good heavenly father, when Jesus saw them, did he go, Ugh, dirty, low down, dirty dog sinners? He had compassion for them. His heart went to them. He saw them. He had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That's what the world is like that doesn't know Jesus. God, forgive us for being so judgmental. Then Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. In the, in the Church of the Nazarene, we're led, guided, kind of overseen by six 
leaders. We call them general superintendents. One of our six leaders is a woman by the name of Carla Sundberg, and she just this week said this, we don't have a harvest problem. We have a labor problem, which is what Jesus said. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And my word today, our first four-letter word, is tell. Can I give you a, just a couple of practical tell tips? Say, okay, Rich, I'd like to tell more people about Jesus. Can I give you just a couple of practical tips? And again, I just preached some of this back in March. And just put it on your calendar. I'll probably preach it again in October. Okay? Because it's important and we need the reminder. Here are some practical tell tips. Tip number one, this is awesome. The greatest act of evangelism, the clearest way to communicate the gospel of Jesus is simply to love people. You don't have to memorize verses. You don't have to come up with some script that you repeat to someone. You don't have to wear the sandwich board out on the corner of, you know, 101st and whatever. You don't have to get out there. The end is near. Repent, turn, or burn. You don't have to do that. You just love people. Do you know why? Because they're created in the image of God and they're loved by your heavenly Father. And so if God loves them, you need to love them. I've told you before, one of the best ways you can ever show me that you love me is by loving my kids. I'm pretty sure God feels the same way. The first and greatest act of evangelism is simply to love people. Your posture matters. It's hard to tell somebody about Jesus when you're already at war with them. There's much to be at war with in the world. But when we're at war with a person or a people group, it's hard to convince them that Jesus is for them when we're not and when we've turned them into an enemy. John Maxwell says, as Christians, we have to decide if we're going to spend our lives connecting with people or correcting people. We can't do both. Remember to follow the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When you need a course adjustment, fall back on that. Number two, first is to love people. Second is this. You still don't need to memorize anything yet. Ha ha. Ready? Second tip. Listen to people. Listen. We come, we as Christians often come with our prepackaged uh, spiel. If you died tonight, would you know where you are going to spend eternity? Let me quote you the five verses that I have now memorized for such a time as this. If that's how God has wired you, God bless you. That's not how God has wired me. And I think that starting and leading with love and connecting with people, and second, listening to them, which is, is going to lead somewhere. Listening to them. People are dying to be heard and seen. And when you pause and slow down long enough to truly listen, opportunities open up. My, my pastor, Shane, my pastor talks about ping moments where the Holy Spirit, you're, you're sitting, you're just talking to somebody in the office, you're, you're at the fence in the backyard, you're talking to your neighbor, and then all of a sudden, your spidey sense goes off. And the Holy Spirit says, this is what you've been praying for, an open door, a ping moment. We won't recognize those ping moments unless we listen. Two things that I would like you to memorize. First is this. It's a question. They're both questions, actually. Not, here's what I believe, you too must believe it. The first is this. Can we pray right now? Can we pray right now? Five words. Can we pray right now? So somebody, you're listening. You've loved this person. They're sharing with you. And you say, can we pray? And then pray for them. And I've said it before. If you come around the corner and you see people praying in the middle of Target, okay, just assume that they've heard this sermon. <laughs> Last Sunday morning, 
Last Sunday morning, Frank and I were talking before church, and Frank was sharing some of his um, need, his physical need, and I didn't pray with him. Three minutes later, somebody else was praying with Frank. I missed it. Somebody else caught it. Can I pray for you right now? Can we pray together? Fourth, can I tell you some of my story? Can I tell you some of my story? And what's your story? What? I don't know. What's your story? Here's my life before I met Jesus. Here's how I met Jesus. Here's the difference that made in my life. Here's what my life was like before I met Jesus. Here's how I met Jesus. Here's the difference he's made. That's our story. We don't have to know every single thing about Jesus. We don't have to know the perfect plan of salvation. You don't have to memorize a whole bunch of stuff. Just tell them your story. That's what being a good witness is. If I get lugged in front of a courthouse, if I get lugged in front of a judge and I have to give witness statements, I don't have to be the expert in the room. I just tell them what I've seen, what I've heard, what I know to be true. That's it. You tell them your story. So, to review, and I've got one more. Love people like God loves them. Listen to people. Truly listen to them. Would it be okay if we prayed? Pray for people. Can I share some of my story with you? Ask, and they might say, no, I'd really rather you didn't. Okay, okay. Somebody else might be planting. It might be somebody else's turn to plant. It's not yours yet. And the last one is this. Do you believe that God sent us Mark Zuckerberg? <laughs> Remember the Facebook guy? I know some of you all have a MySpace testimony. <laughs> I'm looking at you, knights. Okay, preceding Facebook. We have a couple in our church that met on MySpace. How awesome is that? We go back that far. We can use the power of social media. Use your Facebook. Use your Twitter. Use your Tickety Talk. Use your Instagram. Use your social media for good. Don't be a tool. You know what a tool is? Ask somebody who's younger. Don't be a tool online. Because if you're an idiot online and then later you go, anybody want to join me for church on Sunday? They won't. <laughs> be consistent. Love people where they are. Do we trust the Holy Spirit or do we not? Listen to people's stories. Listen to them. Connect with them through your ears. Say, can we pray about that? Can I pray for you? Can I share with you some of my story? And then use social media. Every once in a while when you come in here, would you share the service online? You know people that I don't know. The, the reach of this church can go way beyond our one hour and probably 20 minutes this morning. Would you share stuff that we do? Would you share what you read in the Bible? Would you share and not be a tool the rest of the week? I'm still trying to do that. When we do these things, we are, as we go, Jesus says, as we go, we are telling people the good news. Would you stand up with me? I'm a, I'm a believer in, I'm a believer in, in consistency. I don't always do it. I believe in the theory much more than the practice. I believe in consistency. If I diet and exercise consistently, then good things happen. If I invite people to come and join me for church, good things are going to happen. If I save a dollar a day, good things are going to happen. If I do certain things, good things happen. If I don't, they won't. If we tell the good news about Jesus consistently over a long period of time, 
Jesus builds his church. We may or may not have the greatest preacher in town. We may or may not have the greatest guitar strummers and drum bangers in town. We might not have the greatest children's, youth, building, property, whatever. There's going to be somebody out there that does or is trying to do bigger and better. It's okay. It's God's church. Amen. He grows his church. But if we sit back and do nothing but feed, then the harvest spoils. But if we go and we harvest, his kingdom continues to grow. I don't want a population collapse here in this building. You know what happens if we don't keep on seeding this church family with young people and young believers? Sooner or later, somebody in here is going to be the last one out We're going to turn the lights out. We're going to lock the doors and we're going to go to the bank and we're going to give it back. How sad would that be? Or God's kingdom is coming and we get to be a part of that. Would you like to be a part of that? Love people. Listen to people. Can we pray right now? Can I tell you some of my story? Share what you have that's good with others with your mouth online on your cool phone share it would you bow your heads with me let's pray oh Jesus you you said go and make disciples as you go as you are going as you get up tomorrow and go to work as you cut your grass as you go to the store as you hang out with your friends as you go be making disciples you told your disciples to go and tell we're your disciples That's the work of the church, and I can do better. We can do better. We can be more intentional. We can listen for those moments, those ping moments where we see that the Holy Spirit has already been at work. Somebody else perhaps has already planted and done some good farming, and we get to come in. And help bring a harvest. Help us to love, to listen, to connect with people, and to tell others of the wondrous things you've done for us. The wondrous things that you want to do for this world that you love. Ashley said it about an hour and ten minutes ago. God loved this world so much that he sent his son and he's still sending his son and today through the power of the Holy Spirit he sends his church so God help us to go and to tell in your great name we